Hello and welcome back to The Jump Show. We have a packed video for you all today. But before we get started, I did just want to thank you all for the massive amount of support on the first video. Uh, over 1.8k views, over 250 subs, loads of you joined the Telegram, loads of you followed us over on Twitter. Just a massive thank you from all of us. Fingers crossed we can live up to the very high expectations we set from video one. <laughs> um, anyway, today's video, we're going to be starting off with some eye catches from the opening weekend of jumps racing. That's going to be followed by something just a little bit different. We basically took the top three trainers from Ireland, the top three trainers from the UK, um, and we were both given one from each side to discuss their the campaigns of some of their grade one hopes and also a horse that's maybe gone under the radar as well. I hope that made some sense. If not, then when we get talking about it, I'm sure it'll make a lot of sense. Um, and after all that, we've plucked out some horses to note for the week ahead as well. As ever, I'm joined by Dan. How are you, Dan? Very well, mate. Thank you. West Ham won the <laughs> jump show derby get in early, which was fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Come on, you irons. So really, I couldn't be in a better mood. And Jake was there to witness it firsthand. So perfect. And, yeah. uh, and Jake, how are you? Still uh, still feeling a bit dull after yesterday? Yeah, it was a wasted trip to a awful stadium where you have to <laughs> bring your binoculars with you. Um, but it was all worth it because I had a pint with Dan after the game. But anyway, we move on back to the jump racing. Mm. Well, that's all the pleasantries out of the way anyway. So let's have a little look back at the weekend. We did actually want to do a bit of a review of the racing, but we had some small fields and there was also very quick ground as well. So it scared a lot of the main horses off. So we just thought we'd nail down some eye catchers and I'm going to pass you over to Dan for his. Yeah, as you say, it wasn't the most thrilling start to, to the jump season ever. I think for the next couple of weeks, we'll be saying the jump season really starts next week. Mm. And I think that might continue for a couple of weeks because this weekend isn't looking great either. But there's a few to take out of it. Holly being one of the ones I put up on the first episode uh, last week as one of the horses I was keen to see. She made a handicap debut in what was a very trappy little race. And I think if you look at that, the market kind of told the story of what was going on there. Incredibly weak in the market before the off. Ridden right out the back. Still travelled into contention. Uh, came there and then was given, uh, let's just call it a quiet ride in behind. <laughs> One little go. Go on, try and win your race. Oh, no, she's flattened out. Okay. And with JP Drifters before the off, it's a case of fool me once, shame on you. Fool me 2,000 times, shame on me. And um, we kind of knew she wasn't going to be winning after that market drift. But still, I'd very encouraged by that run. I think she finished behind two very solid horses there. They pulled nicely clear. I know it was only a five-runner race, but a few commentators on course said she looked a bit big in her coat and she'll come on for it. And I think there's still a lot of improvement to come from her. So don't give her a point or yet. Prashima, I thought, shaped pretty well in the Silver Trophy. I think it was a similar case last year. They ended up going to Weatherby for the West Yorkshire Hurdle, which I think he was second in. So they might well take a similar route this time around. And then one from Hexham, a bit off piste, a horse called Azza for Rose Dobbin, who made her chase debut over two miles. He always looked a bit out, or she always looked a bit out pace that day. Mm -hmm. Jumping was fine. But there was some season two mile handicap is in handicappers in there uh, and I think it was always going to be a bit of a tough task over two miles Rose said herself she, she's not a two miler so it was kind of to be expected and if you look at Rose Dobbin chase debutants in handicaps the strike rate's only five percent but then if you look at their second start over fences it improves to 14 percent so up in trip second time over fences she showed enough aptitude for the discipline there I think she's one to keep an eye out on in these low grade handicaps Jake I'll head over to you next for your eye catchers yeah, I completely agree with Dan on Holly. I don't think there's really anything more to add, um, but if you want just to watch for next time. Um, and then the, the one horse that I did want to touch on from the whole weekend really was presenting a queen. Uh, she won the, she made all actually in the Mayor's Novice Hurdle on the Friday. Um, and it was quite an impressive performance really because she had to really tough it out. Um, there was a freak rainstorm at the time. Um, so it was absolutely pissing it down. Um, but she man managed to go from the front, jump really well for a, her first start over hurdles um, and she had about four of them line up to try and take her on but you know one at a time she managed to hold them all off she pulled out a bit more after the last um, and it's a decent race that's been won in the past by the likes of Nina Materia, Wild Romance, Silver Forever, Posh Trish, Colin Sister they've all, all gone on to like listed success grade two success so I think it probably does point her as a you know at least a listed mare um, so yeah she was the one that I took out of the meeting really and I thought Lord Battersley ran pretty well in the Silver Trophy. If he doesn't get hammered by the handicappers, I think he can still win a race at some point. Um, but Napa's Hill was obviously just too good on the day. 
I'm happy to row in with the lads on Holly. I was I was on that day after <laughs> Dan's glowing little write up, um, and also the way he spoke about her as well in the podcast. Um, yeah, frustrating from a from a punting perspective. Um, all right, let's let's get down to the bulk of the video anyway. The top six trainers and their plans for their stable stars, something along those lines. We'll start with you, Jake. You were given Henry de Bromhead from Ireland, um, who yep. is the big Grade One horse. Uh, well, I haven't strayed too far from the obvious, as, as not the point with this section. Um, so I've just gone with Aplutar. He's obviously the, the big grade one hope for them this season. Um, won the Gold Cup last year, obviously. And I imagine this season it'll probably be the same of if the you know if their route isn't broken, then let's not try and fix it and let's do the same thing again. Uh, it's widely reported that he's going to start back out in the Betfair Chase uh, at Haydock in November. Um, I'm sure he'll then go on to the Sabbles, get a nice little break and then go to the Gold Cup nice and fresh like he did when winning it this year. Um, he looks to have as good a chance as ever, uh, but I think his problem obviously this season is going to lie with the Willie Mullins horses. He's got a fair few that he could have a crack at him with. He's got Galifin de Champs, who's actually amazingly now favourite for the Gold Cup over Aplutar, which is a bit strange. Um, obviously, you know, he's got the potential to be a much better horse, but remains to be seen, especially over that type of trip. Uh, you've got Alaho, who could yet step up and trip. We, you know, we don't know the exact plan with him. Um, it'd be very interesting if he did. Um, it'd be you know great for the game, but I'm not sure if it's going to happen. And then you've even got Monkfish, who could be coming back. I know, Willow, you mentioned him on our podcast straight after Cheltenham Festival, that he could be one for, for next year. So, uh, yeah, it's um, Aplutar's race to lose as long as he has a good preparation. Uh, it's just what can come out of the woodwork and take him on, really. Should he be favourite for the Gold Cup, do you think? Like, is that is the market just got this wrong, in your opinion? Uh, I think he should be favourite just based upon he's already been there, done that, got the T-shirt. Um, I think Gal I can see why Gallopin to Chomps is favourite because obviously everyone wants to be on the next big thing, don't they? Uh, whenever they see a novice come out of out, out into open company, you want to be you know on the exciting horse. Um, but for me, Gallopin's got a lot to prove this season. He, he really needs to obviously go to Leopardstown, win these win these uh, three mile grade ones, and then. Even then, we're still probably not going to know that if he fully stays the Gold Cup trip before the Gold Cup, if, if that's where he ends up running. So, uh, yeah, I'd say Aplutar probably should be favourite, but obviously there's not, a, you know, there's not a hell of a lot in the prices. Yeah, I know I know it's not a chat about Gallop into Champs, but judged off what we saw of him as a novice, I wouldn't be backing him to to go and do that over three mile two in a Gold Cup, that's for sure. Um, that's fair. Dan, I believe you got Gordon Elliott, who is the outstanding... Oh, no, sorry. Jake, we're staying with Henry de Bromhead. Who was your under the radar horse? Yeah, so I picked out a couple of his under the radar ones. Uh, one of them's called Tagman. Uh, so he was a very nice bump one at Punchestown. He's owned by Roger Brookhouse, obviously some famous colours there. Um, and he'd previously placed behind Redemption Day and Joya Mashan. Um, so he should make up into a nice novice hurler. He's got some decent bumper form there in, in the book. Uh, Hidden Valley Lake is a point to point recruit for Rob Core. He cost 200k. Um, he was going to win his race by miles and then got carried out by a loose horse at the last. So he looks like he could be a nice novice hurdle type. And then the one that excites me the most, actually, um, hopefully a lot of you haven't have heard of her yet, is a French recruit called Foxy Girl. So she's another for the Rob Core team. Uh, she's private purchasely, a private, a privately purchased after we're finishing second in a listed race at Oi Toy on her debut in, April, a debut in April. So she's obviously still a novice, which is a yeah, really good thing. Um, but that race is working out quite well because the winners won a listed race since and the the fourth place horse has won um, a grade three subsequently as well. So the form looks decent. Uh, she's still a novice. She's related to Triumph Hurdle second, Far West, uh, who used to run for Paul Nichols. Um, and she's 25 to one for the Mayor's Novice, which looks like a decent little price. If you can rack up a little sequence in Ireland, she'll obviously be very much shorter than that. So yeah, she, they, those are my three under the radar ones. Dan, I gave it away a minute ago, but you, you're you with Gordon Elliott, who is the grade one horse you want to talk about. It's an interesting one. If you look at his roster, I mean, there aren't necessarily too many established proper grade one horses at the minute that you could probably pick from a few to do this with. But I went with American Mike just because I think obviously he's fairly short in some of the markets for the Cheltenham Novice Hurdles. And he looks the type to most likely make up into a grade one horse this season. I think like most top novice herders over in Ireland, especially, will probably start off over two miles. Shouldn't have a problem with that trip in Maiden Company. Gordon likes to get him out early, so I imagine it will be October, November we see him. I think there's a damn royal race in early in the end of October, early November, which is one with Envoy and Bally Adam and Mighty Potter in the last three years. So that would be a likely starting point, it would seem. 
From there, I'd imagine they'll probably step him up in trips two and a half. There's the grade two Navan Novice Hurdle in early December, which was on by Jinto last season. Or you've got the Monksfield grade three, which comes, I think, a couple of weeks earlier. And Gordon Elliott's won that five in the past six years. So there's a couple of options, kind of the pre-Christmas time. And then I'd say it's probably likely to go to Lawless of Nace. We know that's become a pretty good trial for the Ballymore in recent years, which I think and most of us would say is his most likely Cheltenham target. And then onto the Ballymore itself. I don't imagine he'll run at the Dublin Racing Festival. It, it, I, I just don't necessarily see a race there being ideal for him. I think three runs before Cheltenham is about perfect. And that kind of gives him a bit of time to, to go to Punchestown as well if they want to. Uh, so that's kind of how I saw his campaign panning out. But again, you could have done probably about five, six or seven of Elliot's horses who were kind of verging on being grade one potential this season. Maybe I'm being a little bit stupid here, though. Why Why do you reckon they're going to go two and a half miles of him? Because I thought he'd be a two-mile horse, all bar the fact that Fassar Vega's beaten him twice in a row now. Yeah, it's, I wouldn't say it's to do with Fassar Vega. I just think you look at him, he, he seems a type, I think you'd say he'll stay a decent trip in time. He's definitely got speed. I don't think there's, there's a lack of speed there being an issue. You need speed in the Valley more anyway. But I just think he's a type who'll come on for an extra half a mile to be at his absolute best over in a novice hurdle campaign. I say he'll start off over two miles and depending on if he looks quicker than expected over two miles, they can stay down that route. Mm. You don't necessarily need to go like up that quickly. I just kind of think looking at some of the, the previous Ballymore types that Elliot's had and horses of his mould, it tends to be two miles starting and then there's a decent little program for two and a half milers like bar the Dace Dublin Racing Festival that you can kind of aim at. Obviously the Lawless of Nace kind of being the big trial uh, pre-Cheltenham for them. I was given Willie Mullins, and I have to caveat this. I don't get my dark horse, do I, then? Oh, sorry. Yeah, no. I keep forgetting that that's an element that we're doing. <laughs> who who well, is the dark horse for Gordon Elliott? Subtle right? horses aren't your speciality, Willow. I know no, you're yeah, trying to... Absolutely yeah. not, and you'll tell that in two <laughs> seconds' time as well when I start speaking. Go on. <laughs> I mean, you could go again. There's there's plenty you could mention here that I think a lot of the horse to follow ones would have mentioned, like to imagine who probably looks like going down the Royal Bond route. Uh, he's a decent bumper winner last season, but I, I went with one who's probably going to be a handicapper, but I think he had a decent season last year, and that's O'Floron, who won a point to point. He won a bumper as well. He was hit and miss during his novice hurdle season last time, but if you look at his bad runs, they came on reappearance, and they also came on heavy ground. And in between that, he has actually quite nice pieces of form. He beat Hey Dor in a maiden, who's now rate 138, and then finished second to Flame Bear in a grade two, and then chased home El Fabiola at Punches. Punchestown. He was two lengths behind Bambridge, giving him three pounds at Navan in January. And then he ran well in the Martin Pipe, went seventh behind Bambridge as well. Uh, staying on after losing his position at a crucial, crucial stage, really coming down the hill. From then on, he never really had a winning chance, but he plugged on quite nicely. Still only a five-year-old. He's rated 131. And if you look at some of those pieces of form I've just mentioned, he looks pretty well handicapped. I think you get him on two and a half miles to three miles on good ground. I think he's the type who can land a decent handicap hurdle this season. Not necessarily at Cheltenham. I'm not sure that track really suited him, but there's a, a decent amount of grade B, grade A handicaps over two and a half to three miles in Ireland. Uh, I think he can pick one of those up. So I got given <laughs> Willie Mullins uh, plenty of grade one horses I could have picked from. So I, I did struggle from that element. Uh, but I picked one real top notcher and then one who I think is going to be the star of her division as well. But I'll start with the really obvious one, and that is Alaho. Um, there's lots of talking points around him, mainly because mainly because Willie Mullins flirted with the uh, three mile division at the back end of last season when he destroyed that field over at Punchestown. Now, I'm interested in what you two think. Do, do you think he's going to go to three? Do you reckon he'll go to three miles or go to you, Jake? Um, as in, like, the Gold Cup three miles? Yeah. Yeah, uh, probably not. I just think that they'll settle with Galloping going to the Gold Cup and Alaho just sticking with the race that they know they can win, um, which I know is boring, and I'd much rather it be the other way around just to see what Alaho can do in a Gold Cup because that would just make his legacy then, wouldn't it? He would then go down as one of the best National Hunt horses that, around. <clears throat> but um, yeah, I think they'll probably just stick with what they know. And Dan, I feel I don't mind asking you as well. If Aplutar was to get injured, and let's say Gallop in Deschamps doesn't stay three miles of offences, he's been quite exuberant of offences today. Do you reckon there's a chance he could get stepped up at that Gold Cup trip? I'd say there's a set of circumstances in which it happens. Mm. Uh, I think that being probably one of them. It needs a few things to happen. He might only require Gallop in Deschamps just to prove a bit too exuberant. 
for them yeah. to think. I mean, it wouldn't be the first time there's been a last minute change in the Mullins camp of targets, would there? You, you can almost see it now. We're a week out. Obviously, Galloping Deschamps is Gold Cup favourite. Like, there's still doubts. Everyone's debating, is he going to stay? Alaho's like four to seven for the Ryanair. And then all of a sudden, there's a little market drift mm. in <laughs> for Alaho. All of a sudden, he's odds against and everyone's starting to panic. And all of a sudden, he's Gold Cup favourite. I'd love to see it. I think it would be it would make the race so much more exciting because we know he's top class. We say he can do it over three miles. I think it would be, it would make the gold cup obviously barring a few of us having to get there as well. It'd make it a real spectacle because he wouldn't yeah. really know. And I think he'd be okay over it now. Personally, I think he, he would, he has the kind of resolution. He has a bit more poise to him than he used to when he struggled to stay three miles. I, I'd love to see it, but. I say, I think it's only a yeah. certain set of circumstances which, which is going to see it happen. The the joy of just exploring that is is fantastic. But then uh, it is, you yeah. crash back down to earth and realise that it's not going to happen. He's just going <laughs> to win three races, four races in a row. Might go back to Punchestown. Town. I suppose it's just, I, I actually think it's more Aplutar than Galloping de Champs, though. If uh, Aplutar wasn't in the division, obviously being the same ownership, then um, there's a chance they might push that boat out and go for the Gold Cup. And the other less obvious one that I landed on um, was Allegor de Vassi. It's a slightly odd one because the calendar doesn't really allow her to become a grade one winner, providing she keeps her own sex, that is. Um, but she won the Solarina hurdle, uh, previously won by some real stars. Brandy Love was back in second that day, and she subsequently won a grade, a grade one over, over hurdles at the back end of the season. And I was just looking back at that race and she just looked built for a fence and she jumped the jumped her hurdles quite big. And I looked back at last year's Mayor's Chase Division and it was poor. I mean, Ellie May was half the horse that, that ran the year before. I felt she was definitely running below herself. Scarlet and Dove was up there. Pink Legend was up there. It was a hundred to one shot. Made O'Malley. Like, we're basically waiting for someone to take this division by the scruff of the neck. And if Alago Davasi returns from her injury in good uh, in good form and jumps a fence like I believe she will, then I think she's going to take some stopping over fences. That is for sure. What she, price is she for the uh, Mez five, Chase? Five to one early doors. Only fives. I know it's a bit of a tough yeah. one, but it's such a short rough. price as well. Considering she'll probably be, end up having to carry a penalty uh, in the race as well, because if if you win a grade two, you have to carry the penalty, which means you may be having to give weight away like Scarlet and Dove did this year. Mm. Um, so that's obviously something to bear in mind if you're going to take the early price but obviously above all you need her to come back from her injury and you know show the form but she definitely looks like a chaser that's for sure the route that I imagine they'll take anyways is there's a grade two mayor's novice at Cork the race was born by both Ellie May and Concertista so you imagine Alagudovasi will be targeted that first time out and be a very short price uh, Concertista went on to win another grade two under a penalty after that as well but yeah I, I do think Alagudovasi could be just a cast above everyone else in the division. Um, my under the radar one is not so under the radar. Jakey, you're gonna you're gonna hate me, big man. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I, la I landed on this horse, and then about three or four days ago, Ruby Walsh stuck him up as a horse to follow for the season. So the limelight <laughs> has been pushed on him. He's no longer under the radar, uh, and that's Gaelic Warrior. Lots of loving for the for Rich Richie at the moment. Um, you could basically copy and paste what I said about him in March last year, if you wanted to, I, I think people might just turn their noses up at him because he was beaten at short odds, jumped to his left. But that was his first time out after 280 days off. His first time in a big field handicap. I think there's so many positives to take from that run. And although Fasal Vega is likely going to take the plaudits, given what he could do this season, I think Gaelic Warwick could be quite a weapon himself. And I think it's a really, really smart move from Willie Mullins to basically say... He's got a good. He got some good experience from that handicap. If we run him again and he goes and wins, he'll lose his novice status. This way, he can remain a novice going into the new season, and uh, and I think he could be a good one to keep on side as well. Jake, we're going to head back to you for your UK trainer, which I believe is Paul Nichols. Yeah. So for Paul Nichols, I've gone for Brave Man's Game. Um, so he had obviously a really good novice campaign last year and winning four times, including the Corto Star. Um, but this year, it's literally his whole campaign is built around the King George. That's the main target, the only target. And anything else that he picks up around that is just a bonus, really. It's just a gigantic disappointment, though, isn't he? Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, look, so he's going to start off a mini for the Charlie Hall, the future stars, intermediate, um, 
chase at Sandown or the 1965 chase at Ascot. So obviously none of those are amazing targets. I'd imagine he'll probably skip the Charlie Hall because it looks like uh, Hoy Senor and Shan Blue are both going to turn up there. So I don't know if you'd really want to be taking them both on first time out. He's got secret so investor I'd... for that race as well. I think he's going to go there. There you go. So I'd imagine it'd be the future stars, just an easy race, three miles at Sandown. Hopefully it's not bottomless. He'll be fine. Probably be very short odds to win that. And then, yeah, he'll he'll be prepped for the King George to the minute. Um, Paul Nichols does it year on year on year, doesn't he, with with these types of horses. Obviously won the Corto Star up the track last year, so we know he handles Kempton really well. Um, and I think you, you could kind of excuse him for the end of last season. Nichols said that he was absolutely primed for Cheltenham where he was a late non-runner in the RSA. And then, obviously, when he went to Aintree, he was then completely over the top at that point, is what Paul was saying. So I think you could kind of forgive that. And because he's such a targeted horse, like he's going to be targeted for one race and one race only. I think you can you, you can get behind him for that King George. At the minute, obviously, the, the, if you look at the anti-post market, it's still full of the Irish horses. We know the Irish horses will always drop out and, you know, go to Leopardstown or go elsewhere. We never get the full list of Irish horses that we we, we think at this stage. Um, so it could turn into a very weak race and it could be very winnable for him. And yeah, as I said, it's going to be his gold cup. So um, I think, yeah, he's got a very good chance in it. I think something I want to ask you two, though, is do you think if he did win it, that he should be then have to go for a gold cup or should he, is that not something that he needs to go for to prove himself at Cheltenham? I... Oh, go on, Dan. On with... You should, no, okay, mate, I'll, I'll give it a go. It's, um, I think the King George win is almost obliged to sometimes go for the gold cup. I think we see it in, and I think he kind of has to really, we don't necessarily know yet his aptitude for children. I know he was beaten in the, in the Valley more, but it's a bit too soon to write him off. He's still a pretty young horse. I think if he's impressive in the King George, you can almost kind of then pull up stumps until the Gold Cup and have a go fresh and and make that yeah. almost secondary target. I think mean, you have to give it a go, right? You can't. I, Nichols isn't really afraid to, unless it, he absolutely knows it doesn't suit certain horses. Like he started to know with Clan, it didn't didn't yeah. suit him. But he took him he enough tries to figure, figure out, didn't he? Like yeah, fifth on the fifth time he blew out, he knew that was enough. <laughs> <laughs> We've only had one with Brave Man's game. I think you give it a go and see how it goes. I think yeah, I agree. I imagine they will go for it if he if he wins the King George, and I suppose it's null and void really because his main target is the King George. But I just don't think he's a spring horse. Like and 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 you know what? It's either he's not a spring horse, or Paul Nichols just campaigns him so aggressively that when it comes to the spring, he's he's just not at his best. If you look back at his novice Herdman campaign, I mean, he picked up was it three wins, maybe four wins, and then bombed out at Cheltenham. But I say bombed out, just got butted by Bob Ollinger, and then was beaten at short odds at Aintree last year. Yeah. Again, aggressively campaigned, didn't get to Cheltenham in the end, but then battered at Aintree. A part of me thinks he's not a spring horse, and a part of me thinks that although we applauded Nichols at the time for running him in so many races, maybe he just wasn't at his best come come the big festivals. And that doesn't so bother Nichols interest. too much, does it? That doesn't bother him too much. He loves picking up like these um, weekend yeah, weekend races. Absolutely. So something very interesting that he did say actually is he goes a bit light after Christmas. So perhaps that explains your theory of you know mm. why he doesn't do so well in the spring. Um, but obviously this year he's probably only going to have two runs, like the, the, the prep run and then the King George. Yeah, that, obviously yeah. he'll be he'll be primed to the minute for the King George, but you know he could still go again for one more race at least. So yeah, that's yeah. that's what I sort of said. Like although although my fear is that he's he's not a spring horse, he doesn't need to be a spring horse if his target's the King George. So you know that's not an issue. Um, who is your under the radar horse for Nichols? Yeah, under the radar I've got a couple as well. So Flemings Tide is one that I think is going to make a really good chaser this year um, if you watch his novice hurdles last season he was just humongous um, and he's related to masterminded no less uh, he's currently rated 122 122 so I think he should win novice handicap chases uh, there's a point-to-point -point recruit called Divil Skin he went for 245 here thousand guineas and he looks decent and the one I'm most excited for is recent recruit from France called Iradando Ir Has uh, he recorded the highest jo joint highest RPR of a juvenile on the French recruits list when finishing second in a listed race at Oitoy on his debut. Um, he only joined the yard in September, so he, he might take a while to get going, but he's in the colours of John Hales, uh, and he could be an extremely good juvenile hurdler for the yard. So he's going to win the Adonis, become three to one favourite for the Triumph, yeah. and bomb out in the Triumph. Got it. Nice one. Yeah, yeah, everyone, everyone, <laughs> that one down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we know the pattern by now. <laughs> Dan, you got given Nicky Henderson from the UK. 
and who was your horses? I mean, I could do a couple. I think uh, Constitution Hill is almost too predictable. I think I, Nikki did mention the possibility of the Ascot hurdle, which I thought was a bit baffling over two mile threes. But I, I just I think it's pretty much programmed to be fighting fifth Christmas hurdle contenders champion hurdle, then punches down on the cards after that. I think that's pretty cut and dry. Yeah. So the one I took a bit more detail on was John Bon. Obviously, the only horse to beat here is one. Constitution Hill. Go on. Just whilst we did touch on Constitution Hill right there, do yep. either of you think that he could flop? I mean, he wouldn't be the first runaway Supreme winner to to disappoint. In do a, you think he just beat season. a lot of crap? <laughs> I don't think it was. The race fell apart a bit, but I think it still took a very impressive horse to travel off a strong pace and make it look as impressive as he did. And I think you kind of have to admire the fact that he handled testing ground at Sandown and then quick ground on an undulating track going the other way around at Cheltenham. Mm-hmm. Like those are characteristics which not many horses possess. So I wasn't saying I believe those things, although that would be very on brand of me to believe something along those lines. But I did want to yeah. like at least sort of ask you the question. Are you still trying to believe that Epitant's better? Match match champion hurdle. No, no, Epitome versus Constitution Hill. Take evens for me. I want Epitome for the mayor's hurdle. No, she won't win that either. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, sorry to break your heart. I'll I'll talk about John Bonds and numb the pain. Um, So I think the market is a bit split on him currently, it seems, for his Cheltenham target. He's he's favourite for the Arc at five to one, but he's best prize of sevens for the Turners as well. Uh, surprises me slightly. I think he's definitely more in the mould of a type who's going to be campaigned like an Argo horse. He's still quite an active type. He enthusiastic racer for his races. He sweats up, as we know. Obviously, a lot has been made out about that. It's not as bad as it actually is, but he is still very much learning and learning to kind of relax with races. So I think he'll start off and be campaigned like a two-miler, at least over the short term. There's a two-mile two novice chase at Kempton that Altior and Shishkin started in. I think that's a reasonable point because then again, if he looks a bit more like a stayer that day, maybe he changed course with him. But I think two miles he's going to stick to. And then from there on, I can see him following kind of the Shishkin path of the wayward lad at Kempton at Christmas onto the Lightning at Doncaster in late January, early February, onto the Arkle. Or I say, if by that stage he's looking a bit slower, maybe divert to the Turners. But I think he'll end up in an Arkle and then kind of build from there. I, I think he's. Some of these paths in two mile chases in Britain for the novice division, I think, are going to be fairly light. So I think Nicky will be quite keen to to farm them as much as possible with John mm. Bond this season. Big scopey yeah. horse, grown a lot over the winter. Mm. Oh, yeah. We <laughs> copied and pasted a hundred times into every stable tour about dozens of horses. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Love the love the classic lines. Well, I've got nothing to add on John Bond, to be fair. I, I do want to see him jump a fence. He did look like he could be potentially better at a fence. Uh, Jake, do you have anything to add on him at all? No, I just think he's an absolute certainty to run him up two mile, two far on Kempton Race. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll see. I think we could get anti post markets with some of these yeah, obscure races. One to <laughs> yeah, literally, yeah. Five, and five, five who pound is your stake. under the radar horse for Nick Anderson? Yeah, I mean, I, again, sometimes he's got a variety of horses which are going to be, I think he might have a decent season with novice herders this year. There's a lot he seems to have. But the one I'm going to go with for a handicap chasing prospect is Blair Gowry. Bumped into some useful types in bumpers and novice hurdles, like the likes of Get a Tonic and Might High, for example. Finally got off the mark over hurdles at a three-mile handicap off 110 last time out. It wasn't a deep race in behind, but he did it nicely from the front. He had to fight off a few challenges that day and stayed on quite nicely. He's only gone up five pounds to that. And if you look at his stamina, it's just all, uh, look at his pedigree, sorry. It's just all stamina. And there's some very useful chasers in the pedigree as well. And he's just built like a proper three mile chaser. Only rated 115. I think connections would be pretty disappointed if he can't prove better than that over fences. So he's one to bear in mind when looking at three mile handicap chasers. Absolutely all over that one. Oh, there we go. Look at that. Love some, <laughs> love some agreement. Love that. I was given Dan Scouten as my UK trainer to have a look at. Um, I had only a very few I could pick from, and I did pick Protector at. Um, ever, ever since they stuck that tongue tie on him as a, as a novice and he won the manifesto, his form has just gone to another level. Obviously, he stayed on like a train in the paddy power. Um, he then went and won the many clouds really well. And he, I thought he ran really well for a long way in the Gold Cup, just ultimately beaten by a much better horse in Aplutar. Um, he was only six turn in seven last year, so there's every chance he improves again. And if he was to get some really testing conditions, then I think you might even see a better performance. But 
I have to take a negative stance on him, really, because I don't think he can win a grade one. He's, his, uh, his outline plan is the bet fair chase, uh, most probably the many clouds, and then the gold cup. But he's going to bump into Apple Tower, both of them. And, I mean, he's got 17 lengths to make up. Um, I did plot a little way that he could win a grade one. Um, and it won't happen, barring injury, because I, I read a report and Scouten said that, you know, he's not going to go there. The plan is to go back to the Gold Cup. That's what he wants to win. Um, but that would be the entry bowl. Obviously, is a horse who handles entry really well. I know he disappointed the back in the last season, but that was after a very tough race in the Gold Cup. Um, but yeah, I think he's most probably one of the best UK three mile chasers. But ultimately, he's just going to struggle to land a blow in one of these grade ones. Do you reckon he has stands a chance in any of them at all? No. I think first time up is probably his best chance. Like if they got him really ready for the Betfair chase, because Aplutar is obviously not going to be 100% for his first start of the season. If you get him completely ready, that's his gold cup, then potentially he could win it. But at the end of the day, he's, we've, we know he's not as good as Aplutar, so I think it will be difficult for him. Um, the only other race I've got down for him is that Dan mentioned the Cotswold chase could be an option for him, but obviously that's just great mm. too as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Interesting you say that Aplutar, going back to Aplutar here, that you don't think he'll be ready first time out or might not be ready first time out. I, thought... I just don't think it'd be 100%, that's all. Like, mm. It'll probably be like 80%. You know, it, 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 You're building up horses at that stage of the season, aren't you? You don't want them to peak that day if you've got the Gold Cup as your main target for the year. Hmm. Very you go back point. to that race last year, a lot of the pre-race talk was basically everyone trying to take him on because he was short and they knew he wasn't going to be geared up for that. Like, I, I think... Yeah. Everyone was taking every other horse in that race. And then the race kind of fell apart. You had a couple of non-runners in there and it kind of, like Next Destination, I think, was one. I yeah, think yeah. it was one of the ones and he, a, a non-runner again for the 17th time in his career. So I can see, like, he's, he's not going to be A1, but he is also an absolute top-notcher who might not need to be. And my under-the-radar horse is not going to be doing anything of note. He's going to be definitely plotting around some random old class threes and class fours in the middle of the week. But... That's once again me. I'm not understanding the assignment clearly. Um, I landed on Paddle Your Own Canoe, the old former Colin Tizard horse. It reached, it reached a mark of 42 of the hurdles and then ran to a mark of 104 over fences later on. When he joined Scouten, he was off a mark of 135 after about a year off. And he probably finished third, first time out. And then he was sent off 15 to 2 for like a grade three handicap chase. And after two fences, his saddle slipped. From that point onwards, they they really messed around with him. They tried holding him and holding him up. They stepped him up to four mile two furlongs. They stuck some seven pound claimer on him that I'd never heard of before, and they got him down to a mark of one two five. So I reckon if they stick a pair of cheat pieces on and they jock Harry Scowen up, I reckon he could. <laughs> I reckon he could win some races. Like, that's what I'm on. Are you thinking it's second coming job. of Captain Chaos? Like... Yes, I absolutely <laughs> am. <laughs> What a legend. <laughs> oh, can just clip that. And, and if that happens, then I, I bow to you, my friend. That would be pretty yeah. impressive. <laughs> that is rogue. I'll give you that. That I did not expect that. Thank one. you very much. <laughs> the most under the radar of all of our horses. That's what I'm here for, boys. So if you guys wanted to let us know who your horses that you really want to follow this season, please drop them down in the comment section below. It's time to move on, though, boys. We're going to be looking at the upcoming week. Dan, I'm going to head to you first. Who are some horses that viewers should be keeping an eye out for this coming week? It's for a bit of context. We are recording this on Monday evening, so we don't mm. have two-day decks for a lot of the cards. So I'm going to start a couple on Thursday and Friday, which are currently de uh, declared, but obviously it, they might not actually run. Uh, so on Thursday at Carlisle, there's Castle Robin in the three-mile handicap chase. He won three times last season in his novice campaign. He's only gone up six pounds for three wins, which is pretty impressive for a horse to do. But I think they really rate this horse, and I think they'll be looking at some of the top handicaps for him later in the season. You look at Charlie Longstone's strike rate in September, October, it's 20%. Then you look at November to April, it goes down to 12%. So this is the kind of time to get on Charlie Longstone's runners. Castle Robin goes well fresh too, and he's won at Carlisle. So I think if he runs, he'll take a lot of beating. And then we move on to you talk through on Friday. The opening novice hurdle has a lot of good entries currently. You've got the likes of leave of absence for Chris Gordon. Uh, it was third in the Aintree Bumper. Prairie Wolf is there as well for Sue Smith. Springwell Bay is entered, but he's also entered, I think, every novice hurdle there is for the next four or five days. So he could run anywhere, but he's an exciting horse to keep an eye on. And that race in general, it's got quite a lot of entries. So keep an eye on that one. It might be informative. And then you have the Novice Handicap Chase over two mile six, which tends to be quite an informative race. Two years ago, in particular, it was a vintage renewal. You get a lot of decent types come out of that. 
There's a horse it entered currently called Autonomous Cloud, who featured in my Winless Ones to Watch column for Racing TV. Shameless now, this would be an, absolutely always. You never miss a trick. <laughs> I've done this enough times now. But it, it, this would be an ambitious first target for him. He's only rated 116, so he'd be at the bottom of the weights. But he's a staying chaser to note for the future if he runs there or if he runs elsewhere. And then in the handicap hurdle, if he runs, JBY is a horse, I think, has a race in him off his mark. He goes well fresh, showed some renewed form towards the end of last season. I think at a mark 130, there is a race in him on a over three miles on a track that doesn't take as much getting as some of the other tracks he's been running on. We'll do our best to notify you if these guys get declared on Twitter, I reckon. So that's a good little plug to go check out our Twitter page. Uh, Jake, who are the horses that you uh, recommend for this week or have looked at this week? Yeah, so I'm actually off to uh, Newton Abbott on Saturday for their intermediate chase card. So they've got a pretty decent card on there. Uh, I haven't really got any like selections or anything yet. Obviously, they'll all be up on my Twitter pages or in the Telegram. Uh, so make sure you go check those out. Um, but the ones that I'm looking at, so in the novice hurdle, there's some really bright prospects. I won't go through all of them, but there's some really nice types ended up. But as Dan said, they pretty much are ended up across the week. And I'm assuming that most of them are just going to go wherever the rain turns up. Um, there's a junior national hunt hurdle on Saturday, which features him Malaya. So he's a full brother to the Malaya who used to run for Nichols in the Delahaye colours. Um, he looks like he could be a smart type for those three-year-old hurdle races. Obviously, I'm sure he'll be no price at all, but he looks like an interesting horse. Uh, the intermediate chase, as we mentioned, uh, Elixir de Nuts is in that. Kiltidi Briggs is in that. Peak Dory is in that as well. He looks like he's going to run, which is quite interesting. Um, but probably the most interesting horse of all is Time Hill. Looks like mm. he's set to make his chase debut in the race. Um and I just wanted to touch on him quickly because Dan brought something to my attention yesterday that he's actually got a price of eight to one for the Turners uh, at the Cheltenham <laughs> Festival, which is just absolutely bonkers. It's probably the worst price I think I've ever seen. Um, he'll come, he's, he's going to be about nine when it gets to the festival, right? And no Turners winner has ever been older than eight for a start. And the more baffling thing about the whole situation is he's more likely to run in the Brown Advisory over three miles considering he's a stairs hurdle horse. And he's 20 to one for that. Um, and But even then, like there's been no nine-year-old winner of the RSA since 1992. So, I mean, he's up against it either way, but mm. that just seems like a very rogue bit of pricing uh, for, the, for, the, for, for, the, uh, for the Turners. Um, other than that, there's a couple of expensive horses to look out for. So in the bumper at Newton Abbott, a uh, private purchase actually, but called Captain Teague uh, for Paul Nichols in the Delahaye colours. Uh, he would have been expensive considering he smashed a horse who went for 100k at the sales um, by eight lengths in his point to point. Um, I think he's going to be having one run in a bumper and then going novice hurdling. So maybe don't get carried away with it, backing him in the champion bumper or anything like that if he bolts up. But uh, he looks like a smart type. And then in the Stratford two mile six fell and maiden, maiden hurdle, Hermes Allen is also entered and he costs 350k for, and he runs in the colours of Jed Mason and uh, Sarah Alex Ferguson. So, yeah, there are a couple of other names to look out for over the next couple of days. Yeah, that novice handicap at Newton Abbott as well has got some decent entries. Warlord, uh, Warlord won it last year, I think. And JPR yeah. One's in, entered, I think, off 129. I think they'd be disappointed if he can't win a race over fences off that. You've got Boot Hill was entered. Obviously, he was entered uh, early in the week and didn't run. So, probably hoping for some rain for him. There's a few other decent ones in that. It's only a small field, but there's some decent types in that one as well as a horse i don't know why i went down this rabbit hole but i looked at the bumper as well and it was obviously as you mentioned there's a few like high profile individuals but the, the one I, I was drawn to for no i'm really struggling why i've gone down this route but there's a horse called is eight in there who's moved to neil king after finishing second in the bumper for brian Barr. now brian Barr wouldn't be known for his bumper runners in fact so when is eight finished second on his rules debut for him it was the on, only his second ever bumper horse, a bumper debutant to place. And the other one came in 2013. And he was only narrowly beaten that day. So it was a hell of a run. He's been bought for 40,000 guineas since. He's actually quite well related. His dam's a half sister to surname. I say he's moved to Neil King now, who won that bumper with one for the road, Tom, in 2020. Obviously, he has a much better record with bumper horses as well. So he's a bit of a rogue profile. But if there are some high profile horses that turn up in that race, he might just sneak <clears> under the radar at a decent price. So. That might be that's probably one of my more obscure shouts and might not even run, but I, I don't I just kind of got drawn into that one. And another one for Saturday as well, which I think is an interesting race, is a two mile, two and a half mile handicap hurdle at Market Raisin. First thing that caught my eye was the fact that Aramax, the old Fred Winter winner, is now with Ben Haslam, as a lot of the uh, the JP horses go who tend to lose their way 
Mm. I mean, to be fair, play to Ben. He does a fantastic job, but you can imagine it's going to be a few below par efforts, and then all of a sudden he's 15 to 8 favourite for a handicap chase of 120. And, I'll uh, wait to see him at Cartmel next summer. That'll be fun. It's, some things are inevitable, <laughs> and that's just one of them, unfortunately. Um, but it's a, a few interesting of a horse in that race as well. Thunder Rock is one. I thought I think he'll probably end up going chasing, so whether this is, would be a prep run for that, I'm not sure. Probably if he does run in this race, the one that would interest me the most is Harbour Lake, who I think looks very well handicapped off 130. I think the plan is to stick over hurdles with him this season. His form from last season has worked out pretty well. I'd say there's no be no surprise at all to see him pick up a race or two over hurdles over two and a half miles this season. Okay. Well, that just about wraps up the podcast. I hope you guys did enjoy it. It was something a little bit different for you today. If you did enjoy this sort of style of video, please do let us know because we can we could try and push the boat out and think of some more a uh, little bit different topics. But anyway, if you guys haven't already, do check us out on Twitter. If you haven't, do follow us on Telegram. And also, if you haven't as well, subscribe to the video and we'll see you all guys next week. Bye.